Paul, alien life in the universe is uh, a fun subject. We see it in science fiction all the time, but some serious scientists are beginning to search for it, as, as we know. Um, how can we begin to understand what this means from a physicist's point of view? 400 years ago, Bruno was burnt at the stake for espousing the idea that there's a plurality of inhabited worlds. The church thought this was a dangerous doctrine, and I think the church got it exactly wrong. If it is the case uh, that life is built into the universe in a fundamental way, if the emergence of life and mind are part of the great outworking of the laws of the universe, then we would expect to find that life is widespread. So I see searching for life elsewhere as a test of the idea that life is not just some sort of irrelevant, meaningless uh, side issue, but is integral to the whole great cosmic thing. So I'm excited by the idea of finding life elsewhere, but completely open-minded as to whether it's out there or not. I think it's a matter to put to the scientific test. What are some of the principles that we can apply to at least put a framework to the search? Why should we expect there to be life elsewhere? Well, uh, these principles go back to ancient Greece. If we believe that nature is uniform, that the same laws apply out there as they do down here, well then whatever laws brought life into existence here could do it there. Uh, then we uh, might also believe in the principle of plenitude, which is that uh, what nature permits, it does tend to realize. And in physics that seems to be true, that when you look at uh, what theory says should be there, Usually nature has made it, whether it's a subatomic particle or a complex system or something. So uh, if life is possible, maybe nature has realized it. That's a, more of an act of faith than a, a deep principle, but it's, it's a, a, a popular one. <laughs> and then finally, the principle of mediocrity, that there shouldn't be anything special or privileged about Earth and its location in the universe. Uh, and that's an idea that goes back to Copernicus. So uh, these are the general principles that lead people to search for life elsewhere and expect that it might be out there. But at the end of the day, it's something that we simply have to test experimentally or observationally. I want to take you a million years in the future, a billion years in the future, and there are only two possibilities at that point. Either we have discovered some form of life or intelligent life in the universe, or we've not. And what would, if for either case, what kinds of conclusions would that help you toward? I think if we find intelligent life elsewhere, it raises very serious issues uh, for the Christian religion, though not for the other world religions. And this is something that I've uh, thought about and written about. Uh, and it's a sort of mischievous argument, but it goes something like this. The Christians believe that God became incarnate through the person of Jesus Christ, and that uh, Jesus Christ died to save, he was the savior, to save what? Not the dolphins, not the great apes, however noble and worthy these uh, creatures may be, but to save humankind. So God took on human flesh to save humankind. Now that may work in a terrestrial context, but now let's look at the great extraterrestrial thing. Maybe there are intelligent beings out there who've been around for a lot longer than us, uh, and these are going to be beings who are scientifically way ahead, they're going to be uh, technologically way ahead, but I submit would also be spiritually way ahead. They would have learned a thing or two in their million or few million years of, uh, of uh, social evolution, and they would surely have uh, figured out how to lead very good lives. By our standards, they would be saintly beings. Now, are these beings not to be saved? And, and this difficulty for Christianity has been appreciated. Theologians have thought about it for some decades. Uh, it seems like you have two choices. One is that, uh, that if um, the little green men, the proverbial little green men are to be saved, then God would have to take on little green flesh. In other words, the incarnation will be repeated around the universe, which seems... Maybe an infinite number of times. Uh, maybe an infinite number of times, which seems, again, sort of ridiculous, doesn't it? Uh, a, a, a sort of a bit of a showman act. And I don't think uh, uh, many uh, Christians like that idea. Uh, the alternative is that somehow another uh, mechanism they're, be they're not they're not or not they're not sinners, saved not, they're not, not saved that we're the only ones to be saved, which would make me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. You know what's so special about Homo sapiens that uh, that we get to be saved and all these saintly beings out there don't. There's another point of view which is that um, we have to spread the word to them and convert <laughs> them, but you know that that's pretty ridiculous too. Or that they could be saved by some other mechanism than an incarnation and. Uh, you know, my, my own point of view is that uh, these are not issues for me, but when I put these uh, ideas to my uh, 
uh, Christian theologian friends, well, they get tied up in all sorts of knots. So uh, I regard this as a challenge to Christianity, less of a challenge to the other religions. Well, it, 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 but it also it, uh, reinforces, in a sense, the existence of the God of any of these religions because it, it might show that life is more prevalent and therefore more baked into the laws of physics. Yeah, so the way, I mean, there's good news and bad news. I think <laughs> the bad news for religion about uh, the discovery of uh, is your of particular alien, one alien life is that, that the world religions really have been uh, the great world religions have been based on our species, yes, very specific yes. to our species. And even just going beyond and thinking about, you know, animal rights and so on makes most religious people a bit uncomfortable. Going to, you know, alien beings who are uh, uh, like saintly beings who are uh, scientifically and uh, ethically uh, way, way ahead of us, uh, thinking about those beings uh, uh, would, would make uh, most pe people, religious people, I think, feel very uncomfortable. So, so that's the bad news. But the good news is, um, uh, if we get away from tr sort of traditional religion and try and replace it by something more like, uh, you know, cosmic meaning or purpose, what Einstein called a cosmic religious feeling, well, then it's positively good news to find that uh, life has popped up all around the universe because it shows that, uh, that we're not just some sort of freaks, that, that, that life on Earth isn't a quirk, a uh, molecular accident, uh, the stupendous improbability of no significance, just an incidental feature in our little corner of the universe. It shows that life is fundamental to the universe and therefore we, we represent something uh, truly deep and truly magnificent and part of the great outworking of things. And so then finding life elsewhere, it's very good news. So I, I'm <laughs> positive about the whole thing. I would love us to find life elsewhere uh, and to show that life is easy to make and widespread and common throughout the universe. It seems like it's a paradox in that whereas your particular religion may be uh, disenfranchised by other life, the fact that there is a religious purpose in a maybe small r is made more substantial. I believe so. That's why I think the church got it totally wrong with, with Bruno. <laughs> they, uh, they should have seen that uh, showing that, that life is built into the, the nature of the universe is something that will be strong evidence for something like a god or a meaning or a purpose. Uh, and not the opposite. Of course, they wanted a miracle. They wanted life on Earth to be the result right. of a miracle. But if, if you give up the notion that uh, life needs a miracle to get it going, uh, then it becomes uh, the whole thing stand on, on its head and it becomes better to believe that life is widespread in the universe. Okay, now let, let's do the opposite. And we're a million, a billion years in the future. And there is not a scintilla of evidence of life anywhere else. And we've explored, if not the universe, of course, at least significant parts of our galaxy, and it is barren. Right, right. Then well, where are we? We have to accept that it may be that life in the universe is restricted to Earth. That's it. Uh, the entire observable universe could be devoid of life except here. People often say, how can that be so? The universe is so vast, there's so many stars and planets and so on, life must have arisen somewhere else. Not true. If you just look at the statistics, uh, Sure, we live in a big universe, lots of planets and so on. Um, but if life formed just from the random shuffling of the building blocks, like the, the amino acids making proteins and so on, it's easy to show uh, that the odds are very heavily against it having happened twice. Uh, so it could be uh, that we are the result of this uh, stupendous improbable accident. Well, then this would be, uh, in my view, evidence against my whole philosophy. Uh, it would be evidence against the notion that we live in a universe in which life and, and mind are an integral and meaningful part uh, and that they are in some way ultimately responsible for bringing the universe into being and giving it its biofriendly form. So uh, th this isn't bad news for me. It, it shows that what I'm saying is testable. <laughs> <laughs> it's testable by finding life elsewhere. And, and yet the odd paradox here is that for religions in general, take the Judeo-Christian Abrahamic faiths, Islam, that the likelihood of maybe their God existing is lower because life is not, it looks like an accident. But the, the, the likelihood of the, of the uh, actual reality of their specific religion becomes higher 
because life then only appeared on Earth, which is part of their mythology. Well, it's true that uh, the great world religions, because they're so much tied to life on Earth and our species in particular, uh, would, would not be much troubled uh, if it uh, turned out that we were alone in the universe. Uh, they would probably feel, well, then there's no threat uh, to their doctrine from any of these uh, difficult issues concerning advanced intelligent aliens or like saintly beings. That's true. Uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, I think it would still undermine uh, the basis of those religions in an important way, unless they wanted to cling to the notion that the origin of life was a miracle, because if, if that's what you want, okay. But if you want to believe that life originated by a natural process, you would have to concede that this process was so stupendously rare that it's happened only once, and then that does make us look like freaks. What I find fascinating is either alternative that occurs, we are alone or we're not alone, there is a legitimate religious approach and a legitimate approach that is atheistic, that either way you can have an explanation to see how each fits into your own philosophical system. And I, one of the things that I have found rather surprising and a bit depressing is that theologians have given very little thought to this extraterrestrial dimension. They really don't want to think about it, it makes them feel uncomfortable. I agree. But uh, if we think back to the history of, uh, say, the Christian religion, and we had the whole problem of Darwinism and the, the row that that caused, um, well, it took them many decades to sort of factor that in. And eventually, for most uh, theologians at least, it's no longer a problem. But they, they did have to rethink a lot of things. The discovery of, uh, of intelligent aliens could happen overnight. I'm actually chair of the SETI Post Detection Committee. So <laughs> if ET calls on my watch, I'll be the second person to know when the person who discovers reports to me the system works. And then, you know, within 24 hours, it could be uh, all around the world's press. Uh, and so suddenly, overnight, all of the world's religions will be confronted with, what does this mean? What does this mean for us? They haven't really given it any thought. So I think it would be prudent for them to, uh, although uh, the discovery of ET is one hell of a long shot, we have to admit, would nevertheless be prudent for theologians to give a little bit of thought onto what it means for their religion if we suddenly find that there are very advanced, very wise, very saintly beings out there who will communicate with us. Are you assuming that if they are very uh, intelligent, they are also very wise and very saintly? I differ from Hollywood in this respect that I don't think uh, that we have to worry about uh, Star Wars or being overrun or any of these sorts of things. I think uh, any community of intelligent beings that has been around for a long time, and simple statistics suggest that if we discover beings out there, they, they'll have been around a, long, a lot longer than us, uh, then they will have had to uh, simply come to terms with their own fallibility. In fact, I would even go so far as to say uh, that although uh, it is anathema in many quarters here on Earth, uh, the notion that we should uh, fiddle around with the human genome, I can well imagine that after some uh, decades or centuries of research, we'll discover that there are certain genes for uh, criminality, certain, uh, if you like, evil genes and good genes, and it will be very tempting to eliminate the evil genes from the human gene pool and uh, ensure that thereafter we have uh, a benign and a peaceful regime here on Earth. And uh, it seems to me that if there are intelligent uh, aliens out there, they'll have learned all about this sort of uh, genetic issue a long time ago. And they will simply have eliminated uh, criminality or evil from their own gene pools. We'll be dealing with exceptionally good beings. And what is the effect of us, uh, we flawed humans, coming into contact with these uh, saintly, exceptionally good beings, even if they've engineered their own saintliness? Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, are we to just shrug it aside, say it's not relevant to our theological worldview? I can't imagine that. 